I'm going to talk today a little bit about um, you know contamination control and the return on investment because there's an investment to be made and there's certainly uh, huge gains to be made as well when you invest in something like contamination control and this really is that that fundamental process that we have to go through um, kind of the behind the scenes as, as Doug mentioned um, you know before we can get into the condition based stuff you know so I'm going to talk a bit about the basics. Uh, I'm going to go over a couple case studies with you guys and really show you how we, we try and quantify what we do in lubrication. Because like any improvement program, lubrication needs to be, uh, the benefits need to be quantified and illustrated properly. And typically that's been a big challenge for us in maintenance. Because we tend to talk in more technical terms, right? You know, we talk in ISO viscosity grade and, and beta ratings and microns and ratios. Um, you know, our management team, they have one metric. They talk in dollars and cents, right? And we need to translate what we know about lubrication and what the benefits are in lubrication, translate that into a cost-benefit analysis that our management team can really get behind and support, right? Um, and, and when we're talking about, you know, the, the investment, we're not really just talking about the, the lubricants themselves. We're talking about uh, a holistic approach to lubrication. You know, the, the cost of lubricants may only represent about 1% of your total annual maintenance budget, but it's those downstream effects of poor lubrication that can be really uh, detrimental to your bottom line. And when I say poor lubrication, let me qualify that a little bit. Not the quality of the lubricant, not in all cases, but we're talking really about um, too much, too little, uh, the wrong type, you know, uh, little contamination control or non-existent <coughs> contamination control. You know, all those things that are the fundamentals to lubrication. So Professor Rubinowitz, he spent 43 years at MIT um, investigating, you know, the loss of machine usefulness. Um, and one of his conclusions was that uh, about 70% of the loss of machine life is due to the loss of surface material. You know, about 15% was obsolescence. Another 15% could be attributed to uh, accidents. But it's that surface degradation that played the biggest role in the loss of machine life. Okay? And if we dig into that 70% a little bit, we'll see that about 50% of that 70 was based on mechanical wear, and then we had another 20%, which was corrosive wear. So if we dig a little bit deeper into that, we find that you know, there's some, some clear standouts here. Uh, abrasion accounts for about 66% as a primary wear mechanism. Uh, erosion, 8%, fatigue, 8%. You know, sum all those up, and we've got 82% of mechanical wear is caused by particle contamination. You know, so it would stand to reason that if we could remove that contamination, proactively keep it from getting into our systems in the first place, you know, we would see a huge benefit. And just on a, a, a little side note here, it costs about one-tenth to keep the contamination from getting into our systems as it does to remove it once it's in there. So there's a huge savings that you can attribute to being proactive when we're talking about contamination control. So let's talk a little bit about these, uh, the mechanical wear mechanisms, uh, abrasion, erosion, and fatigue, just so that you guys have kind of a basis for what these are uh, and how, they, uh, uh, how it happens within your systems. Uh, three body abrasive wear, really we're talking about the two moving surfaces uh, within your machine and the third body would be that particle, uh, that contamination. Okay, so in three body abrasion, um, we have a particle that is somewhat lodged in one of the softer surfaces of two mechanical mating surfaces. Uh, in plastic flow, or, or we'll call this plastic deformation, um, the, the third body is moving the surface material around without actually removing it from the surface. So it's just deforming it a little bit. Uh, in, in cutting wear, when we're talking about three body abrasive cutting wear, uh, we've got a very sharp particle that's actually pulling off material from the mating surface. Okay? Um, and when we do oil analysis, we can see this. We know exactly what this cutting wear looks like. It's, it's kind of a, a corkscrew uh, type wear. It's serrated, it's very sharp, goes on to create other particles and cause more damage within the system. Uh, this is a little bit harder to identify, but over time, uh, the deformation is going to fatigue and it's going to crack and it's going to fall off and go through the system. 
Um, so where it occurs, three-body abrasion occurs uh, anytime clearance size particles uh, get into that mating surface. Uh, the large particles can't get in here. The big ones can't get in there. The smaller ones just float all the way through. All right, so we're, we're concerned with those clearance size particles. Erosion. Um, typically in hydraulic systems we see erosion. We've got high velocity fluid with a lot of contamination in it. That contamination is likely to be um, very abrasive, very hard, silt type particles. As they're changing direction, they're turning corners, um, it abrades you know, that, that turn uh, and the material starts to come off those, uh, uh, those fittings. Um, so really the only way to stop this is to eliminate the particle contamination. Okay? But primarily in hydraulic systems is where we see this. And then contact fatigue, you know, when, again we've got that clearance size particle you know, that gets into the load zone you know, in a rolling element in this area here. In this area, for a split second, we can see pressures up to about half a million PSI where the oil actually turns to a solid uh, in this area. But you've localized half a million PSI in this one area, you're going to see a lot of deformation, a lot of cracking, a lot of fatigue. And over time, we see a lot of spalling in our bearings. And we'll definitely pick that up. So what size particles are causing these damages? We need to know something about the, the inside of our equipment. We need to know what our clearances are and what particles we need to focus on. So the most damaging particles um, are the ones that are about the same size as the oil film. So we need to know what that oil film is. Uh, and we need to make sure that we maintain that oil film. You know? Um, and there's a lot of ways that we need to do that. Viscosity is one of those ways, keeping contaminants like water and air out. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment as well. But uh, you know, some general guidelines on what our clearances are for different components. You know, you'll see pretty good ranges here, but look at these, these lower levels here. Very, very small clearances. You know, really small particles we're talking about. You know, these are the ones that are causing the most damage because large particles simply can't get in here. Large particles tend to fall out of suspension of the lubricant uh, a lot easier than the, the very, uh, the less heavy ones, the, the smaller ones. So how big is a micron? Okay, we've been talking about microns. Our filters, uh, we buy them based on the micron size. The human eye, you know, good human vision can see about a 40 micron black dot on white paper. That's about the extent of really good human vision. Uh, human hair is about 65 to 70 microns in diameter. Right? So we're talking about you know, particles that are the size of bacteria. You know, we won't see them or we won't feel them. You know, if we take an oil sample and we look in the light, you know, we're not going to see these particles that are the size of the ones that are of, of consequence in our systems. You know, so it's very important that we know that um, they're there. It's very difficult to detect them without the proper instruments. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're pulling those out of the system. So how much does it take to really contaminate a system? Right? Um, keep in mind we're talking about those really small bacteria-sized particles, and it doesn't take a lot of them. Really, one, uh, one teaspoon of dirt in a 55-gallon drum will yield a particle count of a 1917-14. Now, that might not mean a lot to you guys right now, but that means there's about a billion particles in this drum which are greater than 4 microns in diameter. And remember, we're talking about those really small particles, the, smart, the particles in the 2 to 5 micron range. Okay, and now we've just added a billion of them to this 55-gallon drum, just in one teaspoon of dirt. So there's a couple things that we need to, to take notice of here. First of all, when we get new oil into our, into our facility, into our plant, we can't assume that it's, it's clean enough for use immediately in service in our equipment. You know, we've probably got very tight targets for cleanliness in our systems, in our components, uh, and the new oil just isn't clean enough in most cases uh, to just go ahead and use. So we want to make sure we're pre-filtering that. That's the proactive uh, measure that we're going to take when we're using new lubricants. You know, clean it up before we use it. Uh, my rule of thumb is uh, clean it two ISO codes cleaner than the target cleanliness of the component it's intended for. All right, so if there is you know, some challenges getting that lubricant from the drum or from the storage unit to the component, we can absorb that contamination. You know, it's not going to affect the overall contamination uh, of the component or the system. 
So let's talk about a couple of the other uh, wear mechanisms that we might find as well um, that are due to um, contamination, but not necessarily uh, solid particle contamination. Uh, corrosive wear. Um, really, this is when the, the, the material surface comes in contact uh, with a corrosive environment. Could be acids, you know, byproducts, uh, could be water, could be air. Those are all contaminants. Uh, it's not just the solid particles that are the contaminants. It's really anything that's in the lubricant that shouldn't be there. And that includes air and it includes water. Uh, and speaking of air, you know, we've got cavitation erosion as well. You know, and, and this, this occurs a lot in hydraulic systems, especially when we have suction line leaks that are very hard to detect. Uh, easy with ultrasound to detect, but you don't walk by the hydraulic system and see a puddle of oil on the floor. You know? um, but once, you know, when we have these air bubbles that are being entrained into that suction line and they go from very, very low pressure uh, to very high pressure rapidly, they implode on themselves and that implosion causes shock waves and causes fatigue. Uh, in the material surface. Okay, so over time, you start to see some of this pitting starting to occur. And once this starts, um, it, it just rapidly progresses. You know, so this doesn't take any time at all once it starts, and this is exactly what cavitation looks like. And then certainly water is, is a contaminant. You know, water is not a good lubricant. Anybody know the viscosity of water? Yeah, one centistoke, right? Uh, so when we're talking about a gearbox, we're talking about a hydraulic system, um, water is nowhere near uh, viscous to be you know, a good lubricant. So when we have water droplets in place of, of lubricant, we have that metal-to-metal -metal contact, and we're going to see the wear that occurs from that. Um, so we need to be able to identify it. Uh, there's several states of coexistence, uh, you know, uh, free water you know, sitting at the bottom of the sump, you know, dissolved water, the water we can't see, but it's there. You know, and then the emulsified water, you know, when you've got that hazy, milky looking uh, lubricant, we take a sample of it, we know it's there. But when you have that kind of water contamination, uh, it really forces the onset of that mechanical wear to start to, uh, to progress. So we need to pull together a strategy. We really, you know, we know that, that contaminants are one of those things that are costing us money because it's reducing the life and the reliability of our components. Right, so we need to set up some strategies on how to control it. Right, and the strategies don't need to be very sophisticated. They can be actually very simple. Um, but the first thing we need to do is set some targets. You know, what are we really trying to achieve? I know we're trying to achieve improved reliability, um, extended life. You know, but is it is a production goal? Is it more of a reliability goal? Set some targets and take some action to achieve those targets. And that action can be very simple. It could be simply upgrading filtra filtration or pre-filtering new oil. Once we take that action, it's really important that we go back and measure those results. Because any improvement program we do within the plant, we need to show some benefit, some return on that investment. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But we really need to go back, measure those results, really understand what it's doing for us. So now we have to figure out, well, how clean should it be? How dry should the lubricant be? You know, if I want a reliable system, if I want a system that's going to last long, if I'm going to get extended life from my system, how clean should it be? How dry should it be? So this is kind of a, a, a compilation of a lot of uh, feedback from filter companies, OEMs, you know, for different components, like gearboxes, hydraulic pumps, that kind of thing. They all kind of have their, their target. Uh, keep in mind, though, that they are in the business of, of building and selling components, not necessarily in the business of... Uh, extending the life of these components. So always use this as like a top shelf kind of recommendation. You know, as clean as reasonably achievable is a good target. Um, but, you know, it really comes down to what the pressure of the system is, how sensitive the components are. And uh, then you have to look at the moisture targets themselves as well. Uh, again, with moisture, it's one of those things. As low as reasonably achievable. You know, because there's an investment. I mean, you can get the water down to less than 10 parts per million if you want, uh, but there's a cost associated to it. Okay, so what's, what's reasonable for your system? Uh, again, it has a lot to do with the type of system, the pressure, uh, the velocity of the fluid, and so on and so on. So I'm going to take you through a case study. Um, and this kind of shows you how we quantify the benefits uh, of, of 
controlling contaminants. Um, it's a really simple case study. Uh, it's on a diesel engine. You may be familiar with them. Um, but before we get into the case study, we need to look at uh, really what the effects of particles are on component life. Okay, because we know that the cleaner the, the oil is, the longer we're going to get out of these components. The, the more reliable they'll be, the, the longer the life extension is going to be as well. Uh, so here's a lot of data that's been compiled. Different systems, hydraulics, gearboxes, engines. You know, so if we look at the engine example, uh, depending on where you land on the particle count, I'll give you a little bit of background on the particle count as well. Um, a couple notes here. Every code you increase, so if you go from 2119.16 to 22.2017, you're effectively doubling the amount of contamination. You're, you're doubling the amount of contamination that's in that lubricant. Okay? Um, so if you reduce it, the particle count, you know, you're reducing it by two times each time you go. So if you're operating uh, a, an engine, you know, at a 24, 22, 19, which is really, really dirty. I mean, that is an extremely dirty system when it comes to oil analysis. If you reduce that down to something like a 2018, 15, uh, you've cleaned it up significantly. You've removed, remember what we talked about a few slides ago, how much it takes to contaminate that barrel of oil? That 55 gallon drum, all it took was one teaspoon of dirt to put, you know, a billion particles, four microns in diameter into that lubricant. You know, so every time we reduce the particle count, we're cutting that contamination in half. Okay? Uh, so you can see the cleaner we get, the more relative component life we're going to get out. But there's a cost associated to this. There's definitely a cost associated with operating at a 2320-118 versus a 14-12-9. You know, the cost of the filters is something you have to consider. The cost of uh, transporting uh, the lubricant, how do we do that? Do we have filter carts? Do we have a way to, to periodically decontaminate the system while it's in operation? Do we have proper storage and handling? That's when we have to start to look at the, the big picture of lubrication programs uh, and the holistic approach. It's not just about decent filters. It's about everything that comes before the lubricant gets into the component. Just like I mentioned earlier, it's these small particles that are causing the most damage. You know, this is a great study that was put together uh, by Cummins. And they were looking at the relative wear rates for engine rings and bearings versus the particle size distribution. Okay, so 10 to 20 microns, relative wear rate was 1, 5 to 10 microns, 0 to 5 microns. You can see that um, particles in the 0 to 5 and 5 to 10 micron range uh, are 3 to 4 times more likely to cause wear you know, than these ones in the 10 to 20. And it's because the big ones just simply can't get into those clearances and cause that damage. And typical full flow oil filters are only 60 to 70 percent efficient at removing 10, par 10 micron particles and less. So that gives us some, something to really think about, right? Um, you know, it gives us something to think about in terms of where we want to put our filter. Is it going to be a full flow filter? Is it going to be a return line filter? Is it going to be an offline kidney loop type filter? And what microns are we going to target? Obviously, we don't want to target the 10 to 20 micron particles. We want to focus in on the smaller size particles. Those are the ones that we're going to get the biggest bang for the buck. So we need to control those silt size particles and as I mentioned it takes this holistic approach. You know we, we simply can't upgrade filters and, and call it a day. We need to look at it from receipt of the lubricant to delivery to the machine, uh, from storage, uh, and then while it's in the machine we have to have a method of removing the particles uh, that are generated within the system. So again, real important to look at new fluid cleanliness. You know, it's not something we can just assume that it's clean. Now you can get lubricants that are very, very clean, you know, before they get to your plant. You know, but if you don't have a proper setup for storage and handling, that clean drum of oil is not going to stay very clean for very long. Right, so we need to look at not only the oil coming in, when it comes in the door, do we have a filter cart? Can we filter the lubricant? Can we pull out all those particles? And then how do we store it? You know, uh, take this example of a bulk tank. 
you know, most of them don't have filtration built in. You know, but if we simply add some, you know, three-way valves and a filter, you know, we can use the existing pump to, uh, um, you know, circulate the oil while it's in storage, keeping it clean, making sure we've got a proper breather installed to keep those contaminants, the moisture and the solid particles uh, from getting in there in the first place. Make sure we've got the proper, properly sized filter on there, you know, a filter that's going to take away those small bacteria-sized particles that we've been talking about, the ones that cause the most damage. And then in this case, in this case study that we're talking about with the diesel engine, you know, having supplemental engine oil filtration, you know, something other than the full flow filter that's uh, installed by the OEM. You know, we, we want to have a way to remove that contamination uh, effectively and remove the silt sized particles that are ones causing the damage. So this is really what that would look like. You know, this is the, the typical system right here that you'd see where you've got the oil pump pulling oil out of the pan, going through the full flow filter. Remember, this is not very effective at taking care of those small particles. You know, it's full flow. It's under a lot of cycling and a lot of loading. The media tends to flex under those cycles. You know, sometimes it lets some debris go back into the system. You know, if there's pressure spikes, you know, sometimes the, uh, um, the oil will bypass the filter on a pressure spike and go unfiltered through the system. So if we simply add, you know, this offline system, you know, have a flow control valve, so we're taking, you know, 10 or 15% of that flow of oil and pulling it through a depth media filter and back into the system, well, we're going to take care of those particles that are the, um, you know, 2 to 5 micron range or that 3 to 5 micron range, the ones that are really important, the ones that are really causing the damage. So very easy to do. Um, if we can do that, if we can reduce the amount of contamination, if we can pull those particles out of there, you know, we can get very clean and extend that engine life. So if we're operating at a 22, 2017, uh, and our relative engine life is about 15,000 hours, which is fairly typical. If we start to filter this, we get it down to an 18, 16, 13. That's 16 times cleaner, 18, 16, 13 is than 22, 2017. Remember, because every time that you, it, you reduce the uh, ISO code, you know, you're cleaning it up by two times. You know, you're cutting that contamination in half. So this is 16 times cleaner, giving us you know, yielding us more engine life in the 50,000 hour range from 15,000 hours up to 50,000 hours. So really significant. So the next thing we need to do is really put some dollars and cents into that. You know, because there's a cost to overhauling and uh, doing repairs on a system like this. You know, so before, I mean, this is very small uh, diesel engine, small loader, Cat 980F. Um, actually, this was a 3 micron cellulose depth media filter, uh, and this was in, you know, it was a bypass system taking 10% of the flow. So if we go back, uh, this is really all that system is. Flow control valve, we take 10% as a slipstream, goes through a depth media filter. It's got a pressure relief valve just in case this plugs uh, before it's changed. That's all they did. They mounted this to the side of that, took 10% of the flow, monitored it with oil analysis, so before, with the standard OEM filtration, the mean time to rebuild was about 14,500 hours. Okay, 14,500, 15,000 hours is very typical. Uh, the ISO code they were operating at uh, in 6 and 14 micron range was 1916. Not a very clean system. The annual rebuild cost, $151,000. Okay, so that's a significant cost, especially if you have a fleet of these. So by simply Installing some offline filtration like this, it's depth media filtration, it's at 3 microns, it's very efficient, taking 10% of that, that uh, oil flow. The mean time to rebuild changed from 14,500 hours to 52,000 hours. You know, so really significant. So the significance there is that we've reduced the annual rebuild cost because we're getting more life out of the engine. You know, so, so the rebuild cost is a lot less because we're not doing it as often. And the rebuilds that we, we are doing, uh, they're not as significant. You know, we're, we're doing them quicker. There's not as much damage there. 
So it's yielding a savings of about $109,000, $110,000 per year. And the initial install cost was about $900 on this. That was the upfront investment. You know, so not a very significant investment at all. The ongoing cost is just the cost of the filters. You know, somewhere in the neighborhood of about $200 per year. So the results, three and a half times life extension. Right, we're getting 52,000 hours mean time between rebuilds. You annualize that savings per year um, at about $100,000. Over five years, that's a significant amount of money. You know, the five-year net present value is very significant now. It's almost as if, why wouldn't we do this? Very small upfront cost, huge return on investment. But oftentimes, this isn't enough. I mean, we need to quantify this in a way that our managers can feel comfortable getting behind. So what we, we try and do uh, is we try and pull it into, you know, a standard cost-benefit analysis. It's real important that we lay out the return on investment in a way like this, because this is how our managers talk. Every day, they're looking at... Uh, cost benefits just like this. So very important. Um, this cost benefit is a, uh, it's based on the time value of money as well because we know that the value of the dollar is worth more today than at any point in the future. Uh, and our management team likes to talk like that too. They like to know that what's today's present value of this investment? What's the return going to be in today's dollars? So we have to discount the cost of this. This is basically the cost of capital, the cost of of using this money to invest, um, your company will have its own discount rate. Um, this is pretty aggressive uh, at 15%. It could be less, it could be a little bit more as well. So looking at the upfront cost for a fleet of trucks, you might uh, have a $70,000 bill to get all these installed, to get them in operation, um, you know, the downtime on the piece of equipment themselves, to the availability just to do it. And then the ongoing cost, you know, to go ahead and, and change those filters and do any maintenance or do any, you know, if a flow control valve needs to be replaced, something like that. So we look at the net cash flow uh, year over year, and we can see the, the benefits, you know, starting to add up here. We discount that to get today's net present value, okay? And you can see that the, uh, the discounted net cash flow is here, and it, it goes down every year because it's being discounted. But if we add all this up, the sum of all this is our net present value. And in this specific case here, it's about $540,000. That's what this investment is worth to us today over the next five years. You know, so these are significant dollars to pay back to the bottom line. Internal rate of return is 259%. I think that if I came to you guys with an investment and said, you guys can you know, make an investment with me and I'll give you back 259% in five years, I'm pretty sure everyone would jump on board with that. I would. But the payback period, this is what a lot of companies like to look at. How long is it going to take to pay this investment back? And in this case, it was less than half a year. You know, just over five months to pay back this total investment. And this is significant. So some of the key takeaways here um, on, on kind of the basics of what we're talking about, the contamination control and, and proactively managing contamination. Take away that particles of moisture have this seriously dramatic effect on the life of your equipment. You know, moisture is more than just a, a nuisance. You know, and in some in some cases in some companies, it's a nuisance. You know, you've got wash downs, you've got uh, processed water, you've got all these uh, sources of ingression that are just getting into your system. And people really look at it like a nuisance, but it really is a contaminant. It's really dangerous to have in your system. Uh, when it takes the place of a lubricant, uh, it's causing a lot of damage. Uh, where contaminant uh, induced failure is suspected, contamination control will always show a positive return on investment. Always. As soon as you start to remove the contaminants from your system, uh, you're starting to uh, add life back to that system. You know, you're increasing the reliability of that system. You're increasing the, uh, the life of that system. And with the right strategy, and remember, the strategy doesn't have to be very sophisticated. You know, set a target, measure it, you know, implement it, and then measure it, and then come back and fill in the gaps. You know, very simple. 
But with the right strategy, controlling those contaminants is po possible even in the most extreme environments. You know, underground mine, very extreme environment. You can control contaminants. You can certainly limit what's going on in those environments. You know, and it, it doesn't take a lot uh, of sophisticated uh, products or equipment to do that. It's really just about the holistic endeavor of lubrication management programs, taking it all the way from, you know, we'll say cradle to grave, receipt of the lubricant all the way to the, uh, the component that you're putting it into, making sure that every step along the way is covered as far as controlling contaminants and maintaining a you know, clean, cool and dry lubricant all the way along. Questions? Do you recommend filtering the oil from the 55 gallon tank into your holding tank or out of the holding tank to the equipment? Um, you know, in the, in the barrel or in the tote that it comes in, it's best to get at it right away because um, we know there's going to be some contaminant in there. So why add that contaminant to our bulk tank? You know, it's going to be harder in the bulk tank. And, and I guess just another, another word about the contamination in new oil. You know, there's additives that are in the new oil that are designed to counteract the effects of those contaminants. Those additives don't care if it's in storage in a drum or in service in a piece of equipment. So it's working against that. Um, so the quicker you can get that out, the longer those additives uh, are going to be available to you in service. Uh, the, the question was, uh, is there a risk of removing additives uh, with such fine filtration? Uh, and that's been talked about a lot and it still continues to be talked about. Um, the fact is that, that most additives uh, are dissolved. They're submicron. Uh, you won't filter those out unless they're attached to a particle. Right? If they're attached to a particle, maybe a soot particle in, in engine oil, they're doing their job. They're keeping it from agglomerating and creating a big particle. So you can pull that out. That's no problem. That, that additive is spent and it's no longer any good. It's doing its function. Only two additives in suspension. Mm -hmm. And it's, so uh, the size is very, very small. Mm -hmm. you, you can uh, filter. Right. You're right? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, so not a, it's not a huge risk in most systems. Yes, it you, can be a risk in some systems. Um, you don't have a problem for, for, uh, in a, in a mic microfilter? Micro. No. They, they have a problem bigger than contamination in oil. Yes. Un cambio de cultura en nuestra gente, no? It is a change of culture in our people. Oh. <coughs> ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué podemos hacer? O sea, es trabajar mucho. What can we do? Did you understand that question? Yeah, so the, so the question is, um, outside of controlling contaminants, um, that's, the, that's one part of a lubrication program. Changing the culture is probably the biggest challenge that most companies face when improving their lubrication program. Um, lubrication is one of those things that we just have to do. You know, if we've got rotating and reciprocating equipment, we've got a lubrication program. Whether we're managing it, whether it's a sophisticated program, it has to happen. Um, so, you know, for decades, you know, we've let lubrication just happen. It hasn't been managed. You know, uh, we would call our lubricators oilers. They would be the guy who swept the floor. Uh, they'd also have an, an oil can. You know, uh, they would check oil levels. Now, that job is a skilled job. We're, they're lubrication technicians. Uh, there's training and certification that goes along with that role. Um, and that's part of the change in culture. But it is always difficult to tell someone what you've been doing for 10 or 20 years all of a sudden is not effective or, or no good. And you have to start doing this. Um, there's a lot of catalysts to change the culture in your company. Uh, training is one of them. Just the awareness that there's a different way, a better way, a more effective way to do something. Um, you know, having those tangible changes, you know, a new lubricant storage area, you know, uh, you know breathers, those are very tangible things. Um, having metrics, KPIs, you know, that, that kind of chart the success of a program so people can get behind it. Uh, you know, rewarding the people doing lubrication. You know, you can design a world-class lubrication program on paper, but the success of that program always rests on the shoulders of the people doing it. And if they don't buy into it, it'll never get done. So it's, it's a big challenge, I agree. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys.